Good morning. Welcome to First Christian Church of Cuyahoga Falls, to all of you gathered here in the sanctuary this morning, and to those of you who gather with us from wherever you are via the live stream, welcome. I'm Pastor Joy Fenton-Jones, and I'm glad that you have taken this time to join together in worship this morning. Before we get too far into the service, I want to make sure I say Happy Father's Day to all of the dads and grandpas and uncles and mentors and a lot of male role models who make a positive difference in our lives. So uh, I know many of you are among us this morning who have had a big impact on, uh, on a lot of lives. So Happy Father's Day to all of you this morning. I also want to say thank you. Since I last saw you two weeks ago, I have been to Zimbabwe and back and had the chance to attend my son's college graduation. If you're a Facebooker, you can take a look. There's a picture or two um, on my Facebook page, but I want to say thank you for the time away and the opportunity to travel there and back, and also for all of your prayers for safe travel. Um, overall, things went pretty smoothly. Finally, I will remind you that we are trying our best to keep a little bit of a record of attendance each Sunday morning. It's not that we're trying to track you. We just want to know who's with us here in worship on Sundays. So if you would be willing to take just a moment, um, jot down the date and the name and how many folks are with you today, you can drop that in the offering plate a little later in the service, or you can even bring it up and just set it here on the podium at the close of worship. So with all of that said, we are going to do uh, what we always do, which is give ourselves the gift of a minute this morning. So I want to invite you, uh, however you came into worship this morning, whether you're feeling calm or feeling anxious, whether you've had a great morning so far, or whether it's been a rocky start to this day, I want to invite you to just take a couple of deep breaths to center your heart and your mind for worship. And we are going to listen to Beth play our prelude this morning. Will you join me in the call to worship? Our relationship with our fathers are complicated. For, For some of us, us our father's, father's love is like God's love. love. Too deep, too long, too wide, too strong, too measured. Some of our dads are here. Some were never here. For some of us, God's love the spaces the fathers left behind. All of us are shaped by the relationship or lack of relationship with our fathers. On this day, we remember what it means to have a father or be a father. We recognize the importance of fathers in our communities. We pledge as a congregation to love and nurture fathers among us so that they will manifest the love of God in all that they do. Amen. Would you please join me in the song, Come Thou Almighty King, page 27 in the hymnal, verses 1 and 2.
is going to bring the microphone around this morning. We've come to a time when we have the opportunity to share our joys and our concerns so we can support each other in prayer. So I would just invite you this morning to share anything that you might have on your heart today. Um, I'd like prayers for our friend Polly. Um, she's having heart issues and the doctors can't figure out what's wrong with her. So prayers for the doctors and for Polly. Um, I have a joy and a concern. I have no voice left. <laughs> um, my joy is that we had a beautiful day and a beautiful turnout for my dad's celebration of life, which was yesterday afternoon. Um, saw uh, several people from church. And um, my concern is that my mom is having back surgery this Friday, so please keep her in, her, in your prayers. Thank you. April, would you just remind me your mom's first name? Her name is Linda. Linda, thanks. All right, would you join me in the spirit and attitude of prayer this morning? God of love and goodness, kindness, patience, gentleness, we come before you this morning, and first of all, we're just grateful. We're grateful for your presence with us. Uh, we're grateful for the gift of a beautiful day, but truly, we recognize that every day is a gift, uh, a gift in which we have the opportunity to wake up and uh, be a source of grace to others. Uh, so we thank you for the gift of this day, for the opportunity that we have to gather in community to love and support each other. We would especially thank you this morning for our fathers. They come in many forms. There are people who have loved and cared for us, who are our dads, our stepdads, our adopted dads, our uncles, our grandpas. Um, and we thank you for all of them, for the way that they've positively influenced our lives, for the way that they have been role models to us, the way that they have nurtured and cared for us and loved and hugged us and helped us to see um, our own values. So we thank you for them this morning. We ask that you would just surround all of the dads among us with a sense of your grace and blessing, that they would know that they are loved and that they are appreciated. God, we also come before you uh, thankful for one particular father who had a wonderful influence on his whole family and whose life was celebrated yesterday afternoon. So we thank you today, especially for the life of Randy Stevenson, for the way that he loved and was loved, and for all of the people who came together yesterday afternoon to celebrate that life um, and to really continue to live out his legacy amongst his family and friends. So we thank you for that today. God, even as we come before you in gratitude with so many reasons to be thankful, we also recognize there are folks we love and care about who have some tough roads ahead, and we would name them before you. We would lift them up to you and just ask that you be a particular source of strength to them right now. We want to lift Polly up to you. Um, it's frustrating to be dealing with a medical malady and to not understand the cause, to not see clearly how best to treat that difficulty. So we just want to lift Polly up to you, ask that you would grant her strength, that you would grant her patience. We ask that you would give wisdom to all of the doctors, the people who are surrounding her and caring for her right now, that they might quickly figure out what is going on so that they can get her back on a road to health and wholeness. And then we would also lift Linda up to you this morning, knowing that she is going to go in for back surgery this Friday. We ask that you would just calm any nerves, any anxiety, um, that you would just be a source of grace and strength to her, that you would guide the hands of the people who are going to care for her so well on Friday, um, that she would quickly be back on that path to recovery, back amongst her friends and family. We just ask for your presence in that situation as well. God, anytime we come before you in prayer, um, sometimes we have to admit that we don't have all the words to say, or we don't choose to speak aloud everything that we're holding in our hearts. And so this morning, we would just keep silence before you for a moment and simply ask that you meet each and every one of us right where we are. A 
It's in the spirit of grace and hope and love that we pray together now as you taught your disciples so long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to close this time of prayer by singing together, Living for Jesus, number 610 in your hymnals, and we'll sing verses 1 and 3. Our first scripture lesson comes from Psalms 1. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path of that sinners tread or sit in the seat of scoffers. But delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water which yield their fruit in its season and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like the shaft that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Well, I'll invite any children or young people who would like to come up for a moment, uh, for a brief children's moment. <laughs> so 
Good morning. I always forget to mention this, so I'm going to tell you the good news right up front that after the children's moment, there are snacks. That's very important, okay? I always forget to say it, but I'm going to say it right off today. That's fine. Yeah, you know, you go ahead, sit right there. That's perfect. Well, we are going to hear an interesting story in just a moment. It comes from the book of Genesis, and I'm going to just give you a little uh, spoiler here and tell you that in this story, somebody does something they're not supposed to do, and they get busted. So here's my question for you this morning. What are some of the ways that we sometimes react when maybe we make a mistake, we do something we're not supposed to do, and we get busted, we get caught? What are some of the good ways we react, maybe some bad ways we react? Any ideas? And as always, we welcome help from the, from the audience. What do we sometimes do? We've done something, maybe we shouldn't have done it, we get, we get caught. How do we react? I heard an important word over here. We make excuses, right? Well, I didn't know. It wasn't my own. Right? It sounds a little like that. We've got, we come up with all these reasons why it wasn't my own. What are some other ways we respond when maybe we do something we shouldn't have done? We get caught. <laughs> we panic, right? You feel your heart. You know that feeling? You just got caught doing something and you feel your heart go boop, 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 boop. And that was a great answer. And you try to think of something really fast to say, right? Anything. What do I say? I got to say something. I heard another important one over here. <laughs> it's very significant. Did anybody hear that answer? We blame somebody else, right? He did it. She did it. They did it. It's her fault. It's his fault, right? We come up with all these things. Ways to, what we say, deflect, right? It wasn't me. It was him. It was her. They made me do it. It wasn't my fault. And I bet we all kind of know in our heart of hearts that all of these are not the best way to respond when we know that we have made a mistake. We just heard this reading from Psalms, and it gives us two pictures. I want you to picture this. One is a tree that's really solid, and its roots go really deep. You know, like the kind of tree that you can't even get your arms around because it's just so big and so solid. And then the other image is kind of like dusty, dirty stuff, and one little breath of wind, and it all just blows away. And I think when we make a mistake, we have a choice. Am I going to be like that tree that's solid, and I'm going to say, you know what? I messed up. I'm sorry. That's that tree, that solid, steady tree. Or are we going to be like that dust, that dirt in the wind that kind of and just blows away with excuses and it wasn't my fault and I didn't do it, right? So I love that image and let's all think um, because we're all going to make mistakes. We know that's going to happen. But let's think about how we can respond to those mistakes by being that solid, rooted tree, all right? Will you pray with me? Will you repeat, repeat a few words after me? Dear God, this morning we admit we make mistakes. And when we do, help us be like that tree with deep roots, able to stand up and say we're sorry. Amen. Thank you. And we've got snacks right here and we've got some juice boxes. Please help yourself. Well, as I just mentioned, our second reading this morning comes from Genesis 3. We're going to tell the whole story. This is the whole chapter of Genesis 3, so it's a little bit longer reading than we sometimes hear. So I'll invite you to just settle in, get comfortable. It's an interesting story, so follow along on the screens, and we're going to hear this story from Genesis chapter 3. And it starts out with a little snake. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, 
we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And the man said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit from the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is it that you've done? And the woman said, well, the serpent tricked me and I ate. And the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity, animosity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will make your pangs in childbirth exceedingly great. In pain you shall bring forth children, yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to the man, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree about which I commanded you, you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you'll eat of it all the days of your life, thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field by the sweat of of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground for out of it you are taken you are dust and to dust you shall return the man named his wife Eve that's the Hebrew word for woman because she was the mother of all the living and the Lord God made garments of skins for the man and for his wife and clothed them then the Lord God said see the humans have become like one of us, knowing good and evil, and now they might reach out their hands and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent them forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which they were taken. He drove out the humans, and at the east of the Garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a sword flaming and turning to guard the way to the tree of life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, from time to time, I like to remind you about the lectionary and the way we move through the church year as Christians. You might remember that just two weeks ago, we celebrated Pentecost, and that marked the end of the season of Easter. After all of that joyful celebration, as of last Sunday, we are now in a season of the church year that is simply called ordinary time. And it's just that. It's kind of ordinary. Until the end of November, we will continue in this ordinary time without any big Christian holidays and only a couple of minor observances. Then on that last Sunday in November, we'll begin Advent and our Christian year will start all over again. This morning, we are going to kick off a new sermon series that's going to carry us through much of this ordinary time. We're going to venture off the lectionary, meaning we won't be using those prescribed readings that the lectionary provides for each Sunday. Instead, we are going to work our way through the book of Genesis with a particular focus on what these Bible stories have to say to us about the art of relationship. 
Now, depending on your background with church and with the Bible, this might seem like an unusual angle to take with regard to the book of Genesis. A lot of us have been taught to read Genesis as though it were a history book, providing us literal details about the origin of the world and its first peoples. Some of us were taught that the world was literally created in six days, as described in Genesis 1. Some of us were taught that the first woman was literally created from the man's rib, as described in Genesis 2, and that woman was therefore subservient to man in some way or another from the very dawn of time. And many of us were taught that the origin of human sin, the fall of humankind, if you will, can be traced back to this passage we just heard in Genesis 3. So on it goes, if we let it, and we can be left with a rather shallow reading of this powerful book that can actually sort of steer us in the wrong direction on a number of subjects. Some years back, I read an insightful book titled In the Beginning by a gifted scholar and author named Karen Armstrong. Now, I will admit to you that I wrote this morning's sermon from Zimbabwe, so I did not have that book in front of me for reference. But I've always remembered Armstrong's fascinating assertion that we would actually be wiser to read the book of Genesis as an early psychology textbook. If we read its chapters again with our eyes and our ears attuned to the art of relationship, we see that Genesis tells an incredible story about the changing relationship between God and humanity and between human beings amongst themselves. We see the dynamics between spouses and partners, between parents and children, between siblings. We see what happens when we fail to take good care of our relationships with God and others, and we see how blessing abounds when we invest the time and energy to cultivate right relationships with God and with one another. In a moment, we're going to ask what principles Genesis 3 has for us around the art of relationship. But before we do that, we are going to set the record straight about what it is we are reading here. The book of Genesis belongs to a genre we call mythology. We might associate that term with ancient Greeks and Romans, yeah? When we hear the word mythology, we tend to think of gods and goddesses like Jupiter or Ares or Athena or Aphrodite. And all those very dramatic and rather magical stories about how those deities interacted with ancient humans. Unfortunately, we may also have been taught to associate the word mythology with things that are just not true. As such, it might seem jarring to learn that Christianity has its own mythology, and some of it is included in our Holy Bible. But that's the truth, and we need to make our peace with it. Just as the ancient Greeks and Romans did, the Hebrew people told big, dramatic stories to help explain the circumstances of their lives. These stories may not have happened exactly as they are recorded, but they point to realities that are very much true. We're going to look at the second half of this story first, and I think we will clearly see the way this particular piece of mythology actually answered or helped to answer some tough human questions. The second half of Genesis 3 that we heard consists of a bunch of consequences for the wrong actions of man and woman. These consequences are meted out in the form of punishments by God upon the various characters of the story. If we give it a moment of thought, I think we can see the questions, some more important than others, that might have been answered by this myth. Now, since it was a snake or serpent that participated in deceiving man and woman, the serpent is the first to receive its punishment. God says to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you among animals. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat the days of your life. God further punishes the snake by giving it a permanently adversarial relationship with humans, saying, they will strike your head and you will strike their heel. In a culture where snakes 
were often poisonous and threatening, this story might have provided some sort of explanation for the existence of such an unhelpful and distasteful little creature. The next punishments handed out are to women. And any woman who has ever given birth can quickly make sense of why ancient people would have sought some explanation for that experience. Childbirth was exceedingly dangerous in the ancient world, and infant mortality was tragically high. Had this truly been God's punishment to woman, it would have been cruel indeed. Instead, we might suppose that women throughout time have sought some reason for the rather unequal experience of bringing a child into this world. By way of explanation, we read this supposed punishment allotted to woman. I will make your pangs in childbirth exceedingly great. In pain you shall bring forth children, yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. I think, in other words, no matter how painful and difficult the process of giving birth, women will continue to do so for the greater good and out of a drive to bring children into the world. Man is next up, and his consequences are a little different. Cursed is the ground because of you, God says. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it'll bring forth. And if you want to eat the plants of the field, it will be by the sweat of your face that you will get that bread out of the ground. It seems this story reveals the hardship and weariness that marked men's lives in the ancient world. The average life expectancy was less than 35 years. And from a young age, most men spent those years working in the fields to eke out enough food that their families might survive. That's a tough living. Nothing was easy, and food on the table meant sweat and toil in the field. It makes good sense that ancient people might have wondered if this difficulty of their lives was some sort of punishment for an imagined wrong. But the final punishment, in my mind, is the most severe and the most telling. As a final consequence for their actions, man and woman are together expelled from paradise and banished from the closeness of God's presence. Here again, if we read this literally as a punishment from God exacted on all humanity, it is unspeakably cruel. After all, as Christians, we trust in the continual closeness and presence of God. We even say that God's Spirit dwells within us, that Jesus lives in our hearts, to suggest that God purposefully set us at a distance from God's presence seems contradictory and even a bit heretical. Instead, I believe this part of the story reveals one of our most difficult and heart-wrenching truths as human beings, that we feel much further from God than we would like to. There is within us a yearning for paradise, a yearning for the world as we know it should be, a yearning for right relationship with God and others, and it stands unfulfilled in our hearts. In our struggle and our disappointment, it is no wonder that humans across the ages have reached out for some explanation as to why. This story is one such explanation. So we've dealt now with all these supposed punishments. Let us now back up to the crime. <laughs> I would suggest it's here we discover the richest insights as to how we might pursue healthier relationships with God and with each other. So our story opened with this crafty little serpent who, for whatever reason, seemed inclined to interfere in the life of this unsuspecting woman. The serpent is not without insight or information. He asks woman if she's been forbidden from eating any of the fruit in the garden, and she replies, well, we can eat of the fruit of the garden, but God said not to eat of that one that's in the middle of the garden, or not even to touch it, or we'll die. But the serpent's ready with a comeback. You're not going to die. God knows that if you eat it, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. 
I want to point out two flaws in the serpent's argument here. I'll point out the first flaw in the, in the form of a question. In whose image were man and woman created in the first place? Man and woman, humankind, you and I, we were created in the image of God in the first place. If woman had been secure and confident in who she was, she might have answered the serpent, I don't need a piece of fruit to be like God. I am already created in God's image. I am already created to be like God. The serpent also suggests that if humans eat from the forbidden fruit, they'll know good and evil. Here's the second flaw. It seems to me that they already knew the difference between good and evil. These first symbolic humans in this symbolic garden, representative of paradise, they are close to God. There's connection, there's communication, there's trust. They walk together. There's right relationship. And they already implicitly understand that anything that breaks that trust, severs communication, and disrupts their connection is evil. It's bad. Maintaining trust, maintaining communication, and staying in connection, that's good. Woman already knows this on some deep level. Here again, the serpent really promises her something she already has and doesn't even need. We've all heard the term original sin. It's been used by the church throughout the ages to suggest a sort of unavoidable sinfulness that's with us from birth. I don't think we need to be quite so dramatic about it. Perhaps original sin is something innate to our humanity that tends to rear its head like that little serpent in the garden, and it trips us up with empty promises. According to this story, what is that original sin? It's insecurity and the belief that we are not enough. We have been created in the very image of the divine, with a divine spark placed within us, and yet most of us walk around most of our days convinced that we are not enough. This origin story teaches us this above all else. Insecurity is a relationship killer. We cannot be in right relationship with God or with others until we accept the wonderful truth that we are God's precious children, and on that reason alone, we are absolutely, unequivocally enough. Once these mythical humans have taken the forbidden fruit and eaten it, their relationship with God immediately begins to unravel. Is it because God comes and yells at them? No. Is it because God's dire predictions come true and upon eating the fruit they fall over dead? No. If insecurity is a relationship killer, shame is the getaway driver. Here they are, still in paradise, seemingly unaffected by their choice to eat the fruit, and they hear the sound of God, their friend, their companion, walking through the garden. This is God with whom they have been in close relationship, God in whose very image they were created, God who breathed life into their very being, but shame drives them to run and hide from their friend, their maker, their God. And from their hiding place behind the bushes, wallowing in their shame, man and woman are called out. They're called out to face up to what they've done. And perhaps for a moment, there was an opportunity to mend that broken relationship. But they fall into a third trap. Insecurity has led to shame, and shame leads to blame. God asks a few questions. He quickly realizes what's happened. He puts the question to man directly. Have you eaten? from that tree of which I commanded you not to eat. And in classic human fashion, the man gathers his courage, points to his wife and says, she did it. (laughs) Woman in turn points the finger at the serpent. Well, he made me do it. We're left with shattered trust, broken relationships, and nobody willing to take any responsibility for the whole mess. We've already looked at the consequences that follow, symbolic though they might be. We are left then to simply recognize the deep truth of this story, that our human insecurity is a terrible adversary 
when we seek to be in right relationship with God and others. That sometimes our shame, when we do make mistakes, leads us to become avoidant and taxes those relationships even further, and we really put the icing on the cake when we point our fingers at other people instead of taking responsibility for our own inevitable errors and shortcomings. If we are going to master the art of relationship, we must begin by taking an honest look at ourselves. Are we secure in who we are? Children of God, created in the divine image, can we stand confident in our own shoes without feeling threatened or tempted by every unwise or unethical suggestion that comes our way? And can we simply own up to our mistakes when we make them, say we're sorry, and do the work of making things right? This morning is Father's Day, and it is no coincidence that I decided to start our series here in Genesis 3. If you're familiar with the term OG, it is a colloquialism for original gangster or just the original. In purely symbolic terms, man, as described in this father, man we call Adam, the Hebrew word for man, he was the OG man, the original husband and father. On him, we have tended to pin responsibility for the entire unfolding of humanity, which is a pretty big burden to place on one guy, symbolic or not. Whenever I think about Father's Day, a day that celebrates the dads and stepdads and uncles and grandfathers, mentors, and other male role models who shaped our lives, I am acutely aware of the sizable burden that has often been placed on men in this culture. Men are expected to be tough, to be virtually emotionless, other than an occasional burst of anger, perhaps, to present a generally impenetrable, impenetrable front as leaders and providers. In another sermon, we can talk about how that's unfair to women, but today, I want to talk about the truth that that's unfair to men. In fact, as our story today reveals, the first symbolic male created as he was in the divine image was a complex guy. He wasn't always the center of attention or the center of the action. He didn't get to call the shots in every circumstance. He felt shame. He felt embarrassment. He felt the pain of broken trust and broken relationship. As we search our own experience and reflect on the fathers and father figures who have influenced our lives, I imagine that they were the same. They were complex people who experienced the whole range of human emotions from celebration to sadness and everything in between. They were real people who felt shame sometimes, experienced insecurity sometimes, got embarrassed sometimes. And the ones we most deeply admire were those who could admit when they made a mistake, say, I'm sorry. It is these multifaceted, anything but stereotypical individuals who have left the most indelible mark on our hearts, and I would suggest, have risen above the behavior of man in today's story. The fathers and grandfathers, uncles, and male role models in our own lives are a shining testimony to what is possible when we embrace the lessons of Genesis 3 and commit ourselves to doing what must be done to be in right relationship with God and others. These role models show us what it is to be secure in who we are, even when we make mistakes, and own up to those mistakes when we must. This sort of calm, non-anxious confidence and wisdom is the bedrock of our character, and it is the starting point for healthy relationships. So let us all be motivated to emulate their example as we grow in relationship with God and with one another. Amen. We move now into a time of responding to God's word. One of the ways we do that is through the sharing of our tithes and offerings. I think Kylie is going to walk our offering plate down and back this morning. I'll remind you that you can put your uh, attendance record in the offering plate right now. And I also want to remind you that money is just one of many, many ways we respond to God's spirit in our hearts. So as we sing together, Blessed Assurance, number 543 in your hymnal, I'll invite you to simply be attentive to the nudge of the Holy Spirit in your own heart in whatever form that might take.
pray with me the prayer of dedication on the screen. Holy God, we are grateful for the incredible hope that you give us through Jesus. He teaches us to view ourselves and others with love and openness, knowing that you love and embrace even those who seem lost. Empower us by your spirit to tell others how much you have done for us so that they too will discover your grace. Use these offerings to support the ministries of our congregation, to renew the sick in body, mind, and spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As we come into our time of communion, I will remind you that here at the Christian Church, we practice an open table. That means you don't need to be a member of this or any church to receive communion this morning. All are welcome at the table. We're going to receive communion today by coming down the center aisle. Uh, I'll be in the front with the bread. You can receive the bread, go to either station to receive the cup, and then return back to your seats by the side aisle. In preparation for communion, we're going to sing together. Uh, this is a new hymn to me this morning, so we'll learn it together. I bind my heart this tide. You may want to turn to number 350 in your blue hymnal, and we'll sing both verses. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. All are welcomed at this table of our Lord, for truly these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we may come to this table that was first set by our Lord Jesus Christ. We come in these moments of silence to seek your forgiveness. We come to seek your guidance. Hear us, speak to us, O oh God. Bless this bread, bless this cup, bless us, so we may live our lives worthy of your abiding love. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.
I do have a few announcements for you this morning. I'm going to invite you one last time. If you haven't turned in that attendance record, that's kind of something new we're doing. So I'm going to remind you um, often here in these first few weeks. I want to remind you that if you're able to volunteer and help us out at the car show, uh, the cruise in, you can see Connie to volunteer. We'll be back out there tomorrow, weather permitting, and most of the Mondays for the rest of the summer. Um, setup starts around 2.30, and if you can come and help clean up a little bit later, around 6, 6, 6.30, if you want to be part of the cleanup crew, um, all are welcome. I want to remind you that next Sunday following worship, we're going to have a congregational conversation. Let me say a couple of words about this. Um, this is just an opportunity for you as a congregation to come together, talk about your hopes and dreams and vision for the future and how your pastoral leadership fits into all of that. I'll remind you that I am currently an interim with you right now. And this conversation is one step uh, in our mutual discernment as to how we want to move forward. So that is a time that all are welcome. It is not a formal meeting. There will be no voting. It's just a time to come together and share uh, some conversation and some insight with one another. I want to let you know that starting next Sunday, Kylie is going to be going off to Otter Camp. I think we have a slide about that too. And if you would be willing to send her some camp mail, I know that she would love to receive a little note or card or letter from you. So there is an address up there on the screen. You could take a picture with your phone if you need the address or uh, check your email and you'll find that uh, in the announcements in your email. With those announcements before us, I'm going to invite you to stand as you're able, whether that is in body or in spirit, and we are going to sing together our closing hymn, Jesus Calls Us or the Tumult. We'll sing verses 1, 4, and 5. invite you to go out from this place and live into the truth that you are all precious children of God, created in the divine image, um, and be like that tree with deep roots that is solid and secure, um, knowing who we are and whose we are, and with the opportunity to share that grace and that love with others. And happy Father's Day. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>